The Honest Money Podcast is powered by 10x Investments, a licensed financial services provider. Consult with your financial advisor and let's 10x your future together. How's it, Warren? Um, I'm lucky enough to be an aunt to a, with a niece and nephew, and I'd like to invest roughly about 250 rand each a month for them. Um, everything I've looked at online shows that only if you're the guardian or the parent, you can open up an investment account. Um, the thing is, I'd like to be able to, you know, have control over it, receive statements every month, see how things are growing, to see if I need to change anything about it. Uh, let me know. Is the only option to set something up through the parents? Thanks so much for your question, Aunt. Um, I, I didn't get your name uh, in the recording, so uh, j just uh, I'm just going to call you Auntie for now. Uh, wh what a nice idea to to kind of set up, uh, uh, you know, an investment for your niece and nephew, and I think it's uh, amazing to do that. Um, the, the the typical answer I would give people uh, for, for you know who have young children is you know open up a tax free savings account for for the young kids and uh, you know if you can try and you know try and maximize the amount of of money you can put in every year which which works out to thirty six thousand rand a year you know and if you did a debit order it would be uh, three thousand rand a month so so for you you know if you wanted to allocate two fifty a month. 250 rand per month that you know then then certainly you know maybe doing a deal with the the parents would be nice from from the point of view that you could do a, you know a top up of a of a debit order if they couldn't do that money but but i know you said that you want control uh, and and certainly if that's the case then then uh, you, you might need to think a little bit out the box because uh, if you don't want to involve the parents and you you want to exercise control of the money then then i think it makes more sense to do something in your own name uh, and and then allocate that money to your niece and nephew, uh, you know, at a later stage when you are ready and you feel that they are ready. Uh, and and so typically, you know, the the big the big concern around uh, d doing an investment in your own name, but for somebody else, will be tax. You know, if, let's just say you started at a, an exchange traded fund or a, a unit trust for for one for your niece and one for your nephew then you know that in a, and it's in your own name what would happen is when you decide to give them the money you would then end up having to uh, you, you know having to actually sell the investment which would cost you tax and then you would give them the the, the money and uh, if it was more than a hundred thousand rand in a year then you would end up paying donations tax as well so 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 control uh, is is one thing but just remember that tax is a big issue as well uh, and so I've never, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think in the world of investing, there's never kind of one answer to all questions. And you know, I think uh, if control is really important to you, then then just be careful that you, you don't, you know, get, get a, a massive amount of money that you leave them. Uh, you know, if it's going to be 250 rand uh, a, a month, um, you know, then just watch out for for donations tax one day, uh, and and uh, you know, be be careful of that. So so one option, for example, is you could start an endowment. Um, now, in the old days, uh, you know, endowments were sold by insurance salesmen. And what they did was they charged lots of big upfront fees. You know, the endowments were incredibly expensive. Uh, and investors were, were told that it was a really tax efficient investment. But but actually, when they looked at their investment after 10 or 20 years, they had almost no growth. And that was because of the fees. And so tax, you know, tax wasn't really a big consideration. But for you, uh, what you could do is uh, go, go and use a, a unit trust platform, for example, um, and and you know they they won't charge you an extra fee for the endowment. They'll just charge you the generic uh, administration fee for for running a platform. Uh, and and then what you do is you uh, you, you start an endowment. Uh, and and if that endowment goes beyond five years, uh, and that's important, uh, th then what will happen is uh, the 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 money that you take out of that endowment one day will be tax free. So you won't you won't pay tax uh, on 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 the on the capital gains. Uh, and you can then, uh, you know, give that money to your niece and nephew. And if you do one endowment, uh, what you or, or two, you can decide. Uh, but if you did one endowment, you could make each of them a joint beneficiary. In other words, you could say, uh, yes, it's my money. I'm in control. But if I die, then 50% of the money goes to my niece and 50% of the money goes to my nephew. And that's just on that endowment. It's not it's not part of your will where you're now saying all of your assets go to your niece and nephew. So certainly that's an option. Uh, and and if the amount uh, 
gets you know above a hundred thousand rand uh, and um, you know what you could do is draw half of the money or, or a portion of the money in one tax year uh, you know and and then give them each fifty thousand rand and then you know wait to the next tax year and then do another fifty thousand rand and and so on and so on so that you don't pay um, donations tax so so there is a way to to do this fairly tax efficiently uh, if, but, and, and I think if, if control is the big issue, that's probably the best idea I can think of. The, the other one, uh, you know, some people talk about is, you know, starting a retirement annuity for each, uh, each child uh, and, and, you know, then giving them the money. And, and, you know, certainly with the way that retirement reforms have gone, uh, you, you know, it means that they will be able to access a little bit of the money every year before they retire. But actually, they would they would be forced to, to access most of the money only after they turn 55. And, and I think, you know, that 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 kind of access to money is a big question you need to decide for yourself. Uh, for, for me, first choice will always be tax free savings account. Second choice would be the, the endowment. I hope that helps. Hi there, Chris here. Quick question, please, for your podcast. I'm thinking of investing money offshore, like taking money directly offshore and investing it there for the long term in equities. The reason that I want to do that is to be able to have some money to be able to purchase a house in cash when I retire, which is going to be in about 20 years. Um, I'm not going to need this money for anything else. Would you say that's a good idea or is there something else that you'd advise? Thank you. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, but, you know, I think offshore investing is, is a very sensible thing to do for, for all investors around the world and South Africa in particular, uh, because our stock market is such a small market now. You know, we've got a, a, a small number of listed shares. Uh, the, the value of the JSC is quite small. Um, and, and so, you know, if you want exposure to, to big tech companies or big pharmaceutical businesses or you know, uh, big motor manufacturers, wh whatever, uh, wh whatever is is built around the world or used around the world that's not made in South Africa, th then you need to, you know, in invest your money, at least a portion of your money overseas to get exposure to those kinds of investments and those kinds of companies. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, for all investors to have a portion of their assets overseas. Uh, to, to give you an idea, uh, I, I don't think that it should be all or nothing. In other words, I don't think you should have all your money overseas or all your money in South Africa. I think you should have a spread of assets. So, so for someone who, um, you know, who is in a financial position where you think uh, you, you might retire with just enough money one day, Chris, then, then I, I think you should have about 25% of your assets offshore. Uh, if you're going to retire with a bit more money, in other words, you, you think you might ha you know, be able to leave some money to, to the next generation, th then you should increase your offshore uh, all allocation to 50%. Uh, and, and if you think you're really going to um, you know, have a lot of money left over for maybe two generations after you, so, so you know, potentially your children and your grandchildren, then, uh, you, you know, then I think your offshore allocation should go up to 75%. The, the reason for that mix is is actually, you know, the decision to allocate money overseas is is about diversification of geography and then diversification over time. You know, when you're investing money overseas uh, and, and you allocate a, a, a portion for grandchildren, let's say you're in your 30s uh, and and you, you, you know, you, you want to be able to make sure that your grandchildren, you might not even be born yet, you might not even have kids yet, uh, you, you know, if, uh, if you've got that kind of a time horizon, then you need to uh, invest so that you don't know what to make sure that you can you can get growth because we don't know what's going to happen going forward in 10 years time. Forget about 50 or 75 years time and, you know, potentially for for grandchildren, they're not even born yet, you know, you, you might be at a time horizon of 50 to 70 years. So. So I think when you've got such a long time horizon, then, then you would allocate a large portion of money to global markets because we don't know in 20 years from now what will be the biggest economy in the world, what will be the biggest stock market, where will the biggest uh, companies be listed. You know, the fact that it's been America for, for pretty, pretty much the last 100 years or, f or 50 years at least uh, doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen into the future. So, so I think, uh, you know, uh, offshore diversification makes a lot of sense, but just make sure that you're doing it uh, according to a fixed structure and a fixed strategy. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, ju just making sure, uh, Chris, that when you, d when you want to get that money back again, that you, you make sure that you don't just do it all in one shot. So if you decide that you want to you know, buy a house one day with, uh, w with a portion of your, your overseas money, don't um, plan to bring it all back on the 1st of January 
you know, in 2042, um, ma make sure that you, you, you do it over, t let's say, a two-year period. Because, again, you want to kind of limit the risks of, of stock markets falling, of currencies being volatile, all of those things. So phasing your money into investments makes sense, and phasing your money out of investments makes equal sense. And then lastly, you, you know, the, if you're going to invest overseas, don't. Uh, uh, my, my suggestion is not to go and buy one or two shares. I, I would go and buy a global index, for example. I'm not sure that I would want to go and be, become a stock picker for, for a long-term investment like, like you're looking at, you know, for 20 years. I, I think buying an index makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. I hope that helps, and, and thanks for your questions. The Stradivarius violin is considered to be the most emotive instrument in the world. That's why you'll often hear it in investment ads, adding drama and the utmost importance to their philosophies, or for the announcement of a fancy new fund manager. 10X investments don't need dramatic instruments to seem impressive. They let the results sing for themselves. So 10X your future without the drama. 10X is a licensed FSP.